So, hello everyone. Welcome to another CP Solvers weekly recap session. I am Shema and um, I'm one of the VMR leaders next to Sammy and Madalena. And I welcome you everyone for today. And before starting this session, I would lead the way to Sukriti, who is going to um, give us some teaching points about Monday's case. Yes, go for it, Sukriti. Thanks, Shema. So, um, I'll, so I'll talk about Monday's case, which was a really beautiful case because um, it illustrated um, something that we see often but don't talk about, which is the intersection between internal medicine and its subspecialties and even the subspecialties within themselves. Um, so we were joined by um, Rafa, Sami, and uh, Dr. Parks to talk about a young male who presented with chest pain. And what was really interesting about the case was the substrate of the case, which was essentially that this um, young male um, had a fa strong family history of uh, venous thromboembolism and um, that he had no cardiovascular risk factors, but he was presenting with the chest pain. Um, so there were a lot of learning points from the case, um, but you know, just to funnel it down, I think, what, and, and Dr. Parks mentioned that for her, the biggest takeaways was, two things essentially, the differential of thrombosis in a young person and the differential for arterial thrombosis. But um, as a resident, the thing that I think I took back was what was um, most unfamiliar for me. Um, that was my learning from the case and that was essentially thrombophilia. So, um, and you know, when, uh, when um, Approaching something that's unfamiliar, something that I've learned from Rabi and Reza is to use something that's familiar, so to use a familiar framework. So I'm going to talk about this as if we were talking about um, acute kidney injury. So essentially think about my whole discussion as pre-renal, renal, and post-renal. So um, I'm going to split thrombophilia into, uh, when thinking about thrombophilia, when do you suspect it? Um, when you have a patient that you are suspecting thrombophilia in, what, how do you work up the patient? And then, you know, uh, what is the likelihood of that being present? And then finally, what is the implication of thrombophilia? Um, so when do you suspect thrombophilia? You suspect thrombophilia essentially in a, in a young male, um, in a young person, um, so when you so essentially when you're approaching thrombosis, you're approaching it from the lens of malignancy. Is there something anatomic? And then the third is thrombophilia. So if you don't have those, you don't have a suspicion for the first two. You're thinking um, a young person, unprovoked thrombosis at an atypical site, especially something like the portal vein or the cerebral vein, um, if they have a family history. And then with women, especially, you're thinking, you know, women who are conceiving or using OCPs. Um, and then you kind of split thrombophilia into inherited and acquired. So this is the second part of the discussion. Inherited, we think about four things, uh, factor five lead in commonly, prothrombin gene mutation, protein C and S, and antithrombin. Um, the learning point for me was uh, in, in within these inherited causes, which ones do you uh, which one do you test for in the acute setting? So um, usually, if you do test for thrombophilia in an acute setting, um, you think of factor five lead-in and prothrombin because protein C, S, and antithrombin may be spuriously low um, in the setting of acute thrombosis or anticoagulation. Um, and then when you move into the acquired bucket, you're thinking of um, antiphospholipid syndrome. And um, so there are three kind of tests for the DRVT. And again, this is affected by the by acute thrombosis and anticoagulation. So typically not sent in the acute setting. And then you have the serology, um, anticardiolipin IgG, M, and then beta-2 glycoprotein. Um, the thing that uh, Dr. Parks talked about that, um, that I found very useful was that, do you really need before you start to work these patients up, you have to ask yourself, do you really need to work these patients up? Was in a patient with an unprovoked thrombosis, um, if they are not young and if they're elderly, they are in 
they are put on anticoagulation indefinitely because of the risk of recurrent thrombosis, which is as high as 30% in five years. Um, so that's something that you need to step back and ask yourself. And then um, the, a poll that she told us was, um, you know, she screens for elevated blood counts. And again, another red flag is splanchnic vein thrombosis, which clues her into MPN, and that's myeloproliferative neoplasms and PNH. Um, and then finally, the implications of um, of, from, of of diagnosing thrombophilia that we often forget and need to keep in mind as providers is, um, you know, a it affects the patient's um, quality of life in terms of uh, their access to resources as well in terms of the their insurance status. It affects their family members uh, because they need to be tested um, and worked up. And and finally. Um, um, you know, the risk, the, these patients, it, it, it causes quite a lot of anxiety because um, they start to think, am I at a higher risk for clots? When in reality, the risk of first time thrombosis in this population is quite low. So it's only about 1.5 to two times the general population. So essentially the absolute risk is quite low. So you have to think about these things, um, you know, when you start to go down that path. So that was it for me. And then um, I think Tuesday is Deborah, so I'm gonna transition to her. So Kudi, I'll just jump in to, um, to highlight some of the things that you just said, which is that the space is so rare. It's so incredibly rare to enter the space. And I love the emphasis on analyzing this problem from the lens of how will it change my management? And I think that's the world of thrombophilia is colored by a lot of fancy schmancy diagnoses. But the question that a lot of hematologists wonder is, what am I gonna do differently when I get an answer? And it's not uncommon that in the acute setting, it doesn't change much. But here's how this case, just to emphasize it, is so radically different um, than many others, which is that you have a patient who comes in with crushing substernal chest pain, has EKG changes consistent with STEMI, has an acute thrombus in the LAD, and you discharge them not on aspirin and Plavix, but you discharge them on an anticoagulant. And so it is key because most patients who have an acute myocardial infarction are discharged on aspirin and Plavix. But this patient wasn't. This patient was given anticoagulant. So you can see that how, how the management changes is recognizing that your patient has in fact a hypercoagulable condition rather than the patient having atherosclerosis. So I think um, as, a, uh, as a incredibly uh, uh, smart and savvy future cardiologist, I think this case is, I'm so glad that you picked this case to reflect on because when you're taking care of these patients as the fellow and then the attending in the future, um, it's so easy to just go on autopilot and be like, you know what, there's a heart attack, so it must be CAD. Um, and so because it's CAD, I'm going to give it antiplatelet and aspirin. But this case emphasizes just how important it is to every single time, even before you label somebody as having hyper hypercoagulable, to ask yourself, why did this patient have this clot? And it was a game changer for me, honestly, because I don't think I've asked that question for all the patients I've diagnosed with a heart attack. And I bet as a result, I've missed some people who didn't have an atherosclerotic event, who had something else. And so I really, really, um, it was shaking to be like, oh, it changes management a lot to even suspect hyper, um, hypercoagulability. Were there any, uh, any points, Sakriti, for you that were a little fuzzy, that weren't clear, that um, are still murky? Um... Nothing at the top of my head, but I think the, the general guidelines on, um, yeah. I did want to ask you, um, if a patient does have an unprovoked clot, I know Dr. Park said that they're indefinitely on anticoagulation, and I think she mentioned that if they were over 50, is that the same um, for a patient that's under 50 in the younger population? I don't know. I really don't know the answer to that. I think that's why she, she literally is one of the world's experts in this. It's, it's crazy because we shared the same office for a whole year. We were co-chief residents um, and you could see this future in her. She has such a passion for this. And so it's really cool for me to see her become one of the world's experts. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I think the principle of provoked versus unprovoked is really simple. If you have a clot out of the blue for no reason, 
you're going to, that's going to happen to you again, for sure. If, if you can find a reason and stop the reason, then yeah, just anticoagulate for a little while. It's such a simple principle. And it goes to show you that simplicity is best in medicine. If you can't find a reason why somebody clotted and you can't stop that, then how else do you treat them without giving them anticoagulant forever? Yeah, a really amazing case. All right, Deborah, let's let's hear about those poker skills. Hi, everyone. I will talk about the case of Tuesday. It was our last section of focus. And it was a 10-year-old boy that had four days of left side abdominal, abdominal and pelvic pain and flank pain. So the first thing that we thought about it, it was a trauma that could have some injury in the spleen, the kidney, if it was something in the testicles, a torsion, an infection, a renocolic or constipation. And then in the HPI, we discovered that the patient was vomiting too. So we got the GI causes uh, like chronic obstruction, um, acute abdomen, PL nephritis, appendicitis, and he, the family history had uh, for kidney or for kidney stones. We thought about that too, that could be like a, a kidney stone from an infection, a cysteine stone. And going for the vitals, the patient presented tachycardic uh, in the abdomen was in the left upper and lower credit was tendiner and presented neutrophilia that we thought about could be an infection or inflammation and a creatinine that's 0 0.98 and he's a 10 year old boy. So this was like a huge rat flag because it, it's higher than an adult. So we see some focus imaging and going for the normal first and then going for the pathologic. Like uh, Dr. Ria said that for the normal one, we see like a bright hyperechoic area and we normally don't see the ureter. And then going for this patient, we saw uh, um, it was uh, a really big, you, we have mega ureters and the patient had like bilateral ureteral stenosis and hydronephrosis. The images was they were really good of the case. I think it sh should really worth to watch it on YouTube. And we did the separate we we we, we different hydronephrosis from polycystic kidney disease. The hydronephrosis looked everything connected, and the polycystic kidney disease it's like the cystics that are separated, and they are not connected. So that was the case of Tuesday and. It was really good. Daryl, that's such an amazing, concise recap. Thank you so much. You taught us about the differential diagnosis of flank pain, abdominal pain, and how hard it can be to distinguish cysts from um, from a dilated ureter. Ravi, not to put you on the spot, I'm curious if you if you know of the case, any other pearls that you think worth are worth re-emphasizing. Yeah, that uh, we were we were there for the case, and uh, I think Deborah likes focus because she did a first discussion on the the first focus session. But uh, yeah, that was very unexpected. I didn't expect to see a mega ureta like that. And then we didn't really pay attention to the cranin elevation. It's in a 10 year old child. So that definitely was abnormal. So I was looking at the cranin and didn't think like, okay, maybe the kidney's not affected. Well, it could be early hydronephrosis. You've probably seen Robbie early hydronephrosis. The cranin doesn't elevate until it's later in the course. And um, the stone, what was very interesting, the stone was not the cause of this. The stone was secondary to the, the urinary stasis. So um, I think the POCUS, we were, we were talking about just in any patient, we go through, somebody had mentioned pre, post, renal, intrarenal, the, the, the schema. So every time we go through renal failure, we always have to look down at the post renal um, uh, part of that schema. And it's very easy when you work up a patient to get the uh, ultrasound probe and just take the ultrasound probe and just scan with the dot to the head and in the mid mid axillary line. And as you go up and down, you see lung, you see spleen on this side, you see kidney. And then on the other side, you see li uh, lung, liver, kidney. And like Dr. Rhea, if you go back and look at it, she did a great explanation that you, in a healthy kidney, you see 
in the center, you see this hyperechoic signal, which is fat, and that's normal. And then you get the normal echogenic texture of the cortex. But in this in this one, there was a lot of anechoic areas, which was signaling um, hydronephrosis. So the, the whole renal medulla was just like dilated and the calyces were dilated. The, the, the anatomy was just distorted. So it's a very, very high yield, um, I guess, uh, evaluation of the patient that you can do at the bedside and not wait three, four hours to get an official ultrasound. You can immediately see that there could be something going on. But yeah, I was not expecting that. That was a fantastic case. And it was interesting. I got all these emails afterwards and people were saying like, wow, what a, what a phenomenal case. They learned a lot about it. Back to you, Robbie. I was, I, I should have emailed you. I definitely felt the same way. And the images are amazing. Deborah, thank you for emphasizing how cool it is for them, for, um, uh, for those to be up on YouTube. And I think the theme so far, Secreti is giving us a masterclass of coronary obstruction from uh, thrombophilia. And Deborah is showing us how important it is to, to um, ultrasound your ure ureteral obstruction in the kidney. So maybe, maybe, maybe Yasmin has some obstruction in store. We'll see. Yasmin, tell us more. Hello, everyone. Now, going into the Wednesday case, we have a 74-year-old female with acute intense abdominal pain. How acute? Two to three hours prior to admission, abdominal distension, no passing of gas. Now, the first things we think about is the mnemotechnic people vascular, infection or inflammation, perforation and obstruction. Now, during the reasoning, we narrowed the DDX towards the ovary or the bowel since the pain or on our patient was 10 out of 10 and localized in the left lower quadrant. So we started seeing that what was the causes of the swelling because we found swelling on, on our patient. Well, there was the fluids, obstruction, the reticulitis, hernias. We thought, well, the, was there a surgery history, which there was not. And well, uh, we keep looking at it and the first investigation to be performed in a patient uh, that we suspect has obstruction or anything vascular going on ischemia is an X-ray, a plain radiograph of the abdomen. Because uh, at the end, this patient had a colonic obstruction due to a volvulus and in this patient, the sigma bubbles, we know, we all know, but, but, but to remember a little bit, we will find the coffee bean sign, which is a bent inner tube sign, inverted U sign, uh, which is the dilated loop of bowel with half centastra that arises in the left lower abdomen and that can extend towards the right upper abdomen. That's the coffee bean sign. So this patient had a colonic wall thickening and the last, the the issue here was in the sigmoid volvulus, transfer colonic, sorry, transfer colonic volvulus. And some pearls about patients that, that are in the, this point of life, 74-year-old female, we see that in these individuals, the most common type of volvulus is the sigmoid, not transverse. And we have to look out in patients with neuropsychiatric disorders, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, they are in higher risk. Fact, these are, uh, these are risk factors, or people that are uh, under treatment with neuroleptic drugs, since they can also interfere with colonic motility and may trigger these volvulus issues. And uh, uh, in older adults, uh, the most common is sigmoid, not, trans not transverse, which is a little bit different. Uh, due to two mechanisms. It could be chronic constipation and a high fiber diet that in both, both instances, the sigmoid colon becomes dilated and loaded with stools, which comes becomes susceptible to torsion. And that's why elderly people with high fiber diet, chronic constipation become more susceptible, especially also patients that are bedridden. I don't know if that's a, you know, a good way to say it, but bedridden. And yeah, that would be basically it. Uh, another little pearl was lactate. We had a little, uh, 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 we had a lactate of 1.4, but in the middle of the uh, exploration, or we had this patient, we had a lactate of 7.2, which made us think, well, maybe it was at least ischemic, the patient was ischemic, and then we had reperfusion, which caused this variation of the lactate. So there it is.
Oh, he delivered as promised another uh, <laughs> obstruction and such a great overview of sigmoid volvulus, but also emphasizing that uh, it's less common version, the transverse colon is also there. And I will tell you, you uh, the key thing to have suspected, like how could you go in with somebody having abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, how could you suspect a volvulus? And this just goes to show you that constipation is not fully benign, that many patients can actually develop um, complications of constipation. So in the next minute, can you all think of any acute complications of constipation? I'll see what the chat, I'll put it in the chat. And like somebody is acutely ill because of chronic constipation. Any thoughts? Yeah, Shema, nausea, vomiting, what disease do you think they might? Yeah, beautiful, Lauren, absolutely right. So there's many mechanisms to get bowel ischemia and bowel perforation. Um, I'll outline the specific diagnoses in a second. Yes, Hans, you can also get diverticulitis. Awesome. Any other thoughts? Sterkel also are beautiful, Ravi. Yep. Ah, there we go. Promises uh, reminding us of the autonomic nervous system, which is amazing. Spot on. I'll clarify that all in a second. Acute megacolon. That's right. Delirium, 100%. Okay. I think it's helpful to clarify the, co uh, uh, the constipation, uh, the complications of chronic constipation into whether there are local issues of the bowel or if there are distant issues. And if you haven't had a patient have vasovagal syncope from trying to have a constipated bowel movement in the hospital, then you haven't been in the hospital long enough and let me know when it happens, okay? Because I promise you it's gonna happen. As Ravi said, you'll also have consequences on the brain with delirium for sure. And you can also get con uh, consequences on the urinary tract. Um, we had a case on RLR. It's called the pee poo phenomenon. I just made that up. It's when the colon gets so big, it blocks the bladder. And so you get bladder obstruction from uh, colonic problems. So when you're thinking uh, constipation complications, Yasmin outlined a very important one, which is volvulus. But the ones that are outside the colon are heart, syncope, brain, delirium, and then GU, bladder outlet obstruction. There's a lot of issues with constipation affecting the GI tract itself. And the most common ones aren't acute. It's getting hemorrhoids and getting fissures. So anal fissure or hemorrhoids, very common, but not acute diseases. The acute diseases are volvulus, causing bowel ischemia, as Lauren said, and um, also sterical ulcers. So sterical ulcers are ulcers in the rectum that happen because of really heavy, hard stool that causes a pressure-induced ulceration. And that pressure-induced ulceration can cause diverticulitis, as Hans said, and can also cause a perforation, um, as multiple people said in the chat. You can also, um, Shema started, off, started us off by saying um, nausea and vomiting, you can also get small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or SIBO from chronic constipation. So if you're thinking my patient has constipation and they're acutely ill, how does that help me? I'd say prioritize a volvulus, prioritize a sterpler ulcer, but also remain open to the fact that many distant effects can be happening. Delirium, um, uh, uh, vasovagal syncope through the autonomic system as promise ha highlighted, and also bladder outlet obstruction. It's so common and often an innocent bystander, but if you can make that leap, um, don't ignore it because treating the constipation is the only way you can reverse any of these things. So Yasmin, thank you for emphasizing um, just how um, morbid this condition is, a lactate of 7.4, um, how important it is to diagnose it and how it's anchored in the patient's history of chronic constipation. Um, lovely people, we're at the halfway mark. Um, and so want to just take a pause for a minute to see if any questions have come up about Socrates' um, wonderful case of thrombophilia, of Deborah's case of pocus with um, obstruction, with ureal obstruction, and the other obstruction from Yasmin, the transvolvulus. Any questions so far? I have a question about this, this last case, just going through the motions. Just the fact that the patient wasn't passing gas. Oh my, God, really... my, God, sorry, Robbie. my brain is that of a two-year-old because when you said going through the motions in a patient, <laughs> <laughs> going through the loose motions. Yeah, there go go. The, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I'm a this child. Patient... I'm a child. I can't help it. <laughs> yeah, we need we need some humor at the halfway point. But uh, <laughs> yeah, this uh, this patient not passing any gas. Yeah. I mean, does is that really stand out? Is that to help your reasoning swing it towards something like a, an obstruction as in this case. 
yeah, I think it changes my calculus radically. The truth is, um, I don't want to spoil, um, I know Marcella is here and she told me she was listening to a, the most recent RLR. It's a very humbling case. Um, this is the, the one, this is RLR on Patreon. It's a very humbling case. And in it, we discuss how hard it is to diagnose obstruction because obstruction can just look like worsening constipation. It's very hard to say, does this person have a bowel obstruction or do they just have worsening of their chronic constipation? And the inability to pass gas is a powerful determinant because although I don't think it's studied, I do believe that patients with constipation pass, usually pass more gas than, than others and usually are frustrated with the amount of flatulence they have. So the complete lack of passing gas is especially important because the competing diagnosis, um, chronic constipation usually is associated with discomfort and excessive flatulence. So I find it very helpful, but I don't know what the data is, honestly. Yeah. Yeah, the other thing that was interesting while I listened to this, the lactate of 1.4, why repeat? Usually we're taught or we teach everybody if it's above two, repeat, but below two, just don't have to repeat it. But what made them want to repeat it again? And then suddenly they got the value of 7.2. Yeah, you know, I think in the ER, I have learned to be very wary and scared of patients who are presenting very quickly. Because, you know, we associate all these diseases that come to the hospital by having a, a symptom complex on the order of day, a day or two or three. Like say somebody with uh, pneumonia comes in a couple of days into their syndrome. But what if somebody with pneumonia comes in very quickly and early? And um, we've had a case on RLR where somebody presented with acute cerebellar ataxia on the right side. And we thought it was a stroke. Two days later, it was bilateral cerebellar ataxia from EBV. And then in, in that point, Reza just highlights how in very early in a patient's presentation, you have to be very careful that the syndrome isn't evolving before your eyes, that isn't gonna change. We're very used to saying that the patient has already presented with their illness and it's there for me to to pick it up and figure it out. But it's not uncommon, I think, for patients to still be evolving in their syndrome. So would I have rechecked the lactate? Probably not. But kudos to the people who did, who, who, who probably in the moment recognized that there's something that's evolving about the patient, be it their exam got worse or whatnot. I don't think I would have, quite honestly. Um, but it's humbling to be reminded of the evolution of patients sometimes. Same here. I don't think I would have rechecked it. But uh... This was very surprising. Maybe down the line, we'll have to recheck it. Yeah, 100%. I certainly got to calibrate, you know, like you have to be careful how much you use every case to radically change your practice. But, you know, every case is like, huh, maybe I should think about that more for sure. Yeah. All right, Shaba, are you going to continue the theme of obstruction or are you going to take us somewhere else? We'll see. <laughs> so um, I would lead the way to Thursday's case. It was presented by Andrea and was a very great uh, discussion by Promise. Um, it was a 56-year-old female presenting with diffuse subcutaneous nodules with an overlying erythematous rash and generalized weakness. And uh, the labs were notable for severe hypercalcemia and elevated vitamin D levels with suppressed PTH and PTH-related peptide. And on the punch biopsy of the subcutaneous nod nodules, it came out to be um, a subcutaneous uh, variant of um, sarcoidosis. So it's, uh, it was called Daria, Ross Daria Rossi variant, and it's uh, we learned basically about the, <laughs> the cutaneous manifestations of sarcoidosis. And for this, um, I made myself some um, teaching points. So what I learned about cutaneous manifestations of sarcoidosis, that um, skin manifestations um, come up in 25% of sarcoid cases, and we are differentiated between specific and unspecific lesions, like specific skin manifestations it, uh, show up with non seceding granulomas on biopsy, and these include most commonly papules and nodules. And in this case, we had a subcutaneous variant, which was this Daria Rossi variant. But um, there are also unspecific skin manifestations, and the most common is erythema nodosum, as you know, is presenting with these tender nodules in the lower extremities, but also other unspecific manifestations are things like calcinosis cutis or sweet syndrome. And my second teaching pearl is basically what I learned while reading a little bit on up to date is um, an easy clinical test of these skin manifestations 
there is this di dioscopy. So basically, if you put some pressure on these skin lesions, you can evaluate uh, whether it is a granulomatous skin disease. Like um, if you take some glass and put pressure on a, a superficial erythema and you see whether you see any kind of blanching, like if you have purpura or if you have um, a petechiae or if you have a nevus, you usually don't see any blanching. And if you have an inflammatory skin lesion, like a granulomatous skin lesion, like in sarcoidosis or in tuberculosis, like in lupus vulgaris, you usually see a sparing. And there is a typical apple jelly color during the compression of this lesion. I would also like to show a picture if it's possible. Uh, can I share my screen? Um, okay, so yeah. Let me show you this picture. So you see, um, you see, uh, as you can see here, um, we put some pressure, and this is called an apple jelly colored nodule. So uh, you can see these on granulomatous sk uh, skin disease. So it's not specific for sarcoid. It can also be also be like in this case due to a skin, a skin manifestation of tuberculosis. Yeah. And my last teaching pearl is basically that came up for me was about ACE, which was also elevated in this case. I always associated high ACE levels of sarcoid. And then I read it's not very specific or sensitive for it. Like you can have it in during several infections like leprosy, TB, also pneumoconiosis, or uh, also hypersensitivity pneumonitis, also diabetes mellitus, and also malignancies like. Um, Hodgkin lymphoma or Gaucher's disease. Yeah, that's all. I love that, Shamer. I love how you're emphasizing the things that are helpful, like the apple. What is it? Apple. I, I, I can't remember that. I can remember the picture, which I'm really glad that you showed it. But the ACE is, is definitely a plus minus. Um, since Promise is here, Promise, I'm curious, like what learning point stuck with you the most when you were, um, uh, when you were going through the case in real time? Um. Uh, like in terms of discussion wise or like the medicine wise? Oh, medicine wise. Um, I think for me, like I obviously like at that moment, I was like, okay, those modules is definitely like something that I should, I've learned and I should have thought of, uh, but nothing was really like ringing mm -hmm. the bell. But I think because the way I learned Sarcord is it's always like, uh, it seems like it's always really like there would be some sort of lung involvement, um, like a fibrotic lung or something. So yeah. the fact that this patient doesn't have this, it really wasn't causing yeah. my brain to think into that direction. Um, and then I think the other biggest takeaway I got out of this case is I definitely learned um, the granulomatous disease differential diagnosis. So. It's interesting because I was very triggered when I saw Friday's case. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I can't think of a better segue. I think we went from obstruction to obstruction and Shema um, emphasized the importance of suspecting granulomatous diseases and including how an ACE just, um, con an ACE is elevated in many granulomatous diseases. So it helps you in the sense that it helps you wonder and worry about um, granulomatous disease. Um, like sarcoid, but maybe you have another granulomatous disease that Marcella, who is here, um, brought to us on Friday. Take it away, my friend. Um, so yeah, I feel more pressure right now because Marcella's here. <laughs> it's like we have the expert here. <laughs> um, okay, so we have a 42-year-old male from Brazil who presents with B symptoms and pain in lower extremities, uh, worsened with physical activity and burning sensation. Um, also, he has lower extremity edema in a subacute time course. And the final diagnosis was lep lepromatous uh, leprosy. And I kind of just reflected on like the clinical reasoning process and what helped us to make a lot of uh, progress in terms of diagnosis. So I think um, the first point that Reza pointed out was that it's very unusual for a patient to have 
like edema, but then continual weight loss. And I think because of that, uh, we definitely wanted to include malignancy in the case. But for me personally, I was thinking a lot about like some sort of tumor for the whole time because of the B symptoms. But in the second aliquot, when we learned that this patient is from Brazil, he's a farmer, um, and then we saw signs and symptoms of uh, systemic inflammation, such as like cervical lymphadenopathy, like hepatosplenomegaly. Um, we started to, like, at least for me, I started to also include like infectious, especially something maybe like fungal or something that's more of a chronic time course. Um, and I really admire how Ravi and Reza pretty much just thought about, like, they really cl cl like clue in into the lower extremity neuropathy um, and how they pretty much like just thought of like a, per a peripheral neuropathy right away instead of thinking about like a CNS cause because in the physical exam, it was normal cranial nerves, normal reflexes, normal coordination. So it really brings them down to thinking about a peripheral uh, neuropathy. And I think that's kind of something that I took away where when you have someone with B symptoms, it's very easy to think of like, oh, TB or like uh, cancer. But then because this neuropathy is so stands out, like they really picked on that. And then in the labs and imaging, um, they saw in the ENG studies that is like a mixed uh, axono and or demyelinating results, which really narrowed down the DDX that uh, Reza shows. I highly recommend watching the recording. Um, it nar really narrowed down the DDX into either like uh, castamins, like a paraneoplastic process or like infectious, which could be HIV or leprosy, um, and then or some sort of autoimmune like lupus or sarcoid. Um, and the another takeaway from this case is like with this kind of DDX, we have to consider what is the most probable. And so because of this patient is from uh, an area that's endemic with leprosy, we think that it's most likely being a uh, leprosy, even though the presentation is not as uh, common. And uh, Marcella also taught us that uh, with uh, mycobacterium leprosy, when you see, like they stain positive for AFB, but they're different from a TB in that they actually form like glo uh, globis, whereas TB, because they have a court factor, they form lines. And I looked up and I thought that was really cool. <laughs> Yeah, so I think like to summarize, um, I would think that remember the mixed axonal and if we see a mixed results on ENG, which um, we would want to think about that narrow list of DDX. And we also, a teaching point from that would be if it's like a demyelinating process, if you see a decrease in uh, conduction velocity, then and, and only that, then it would be demyelinating. And uh, for the demyelinating, we would also see kind of like, oh, you could have upper extremity and lower extremity together. But then if it's an axono, then it usually starts from the, the farthest in the axon and then it moves up. Um, and it's usually for axonos just decrease in the amplitude. Um, and also for patients with B symptoms in an endemic area, make sure to ask their family history because <laughs> Marcella hit that fact that uh, they actually, their mom and the brother has uh, leprosy. Um, and then for biopsy, remember that uh, you could see, uh, when you see glo uh, globi in a positive AFD, it's uh, leprosy. Um, that's all I have for this case. Yeah, I promise that was amazing. I especially love the summary because it really, it's so nice to ha hear you teach and then hear you re-emphasize the things that are really important. It really helps things stick. And the truth is that you were kind to Reza and I for suspecting this diagnosis, but we weren't the first people to mention it. In fact, the first person to mention it is here in the chat. Her name is Leah. Um, she thought of it very early. So yet another reason for you all to consider joining live um, because there's no other way you will learn from the brilliance of the chat than to be there in real time. Uh, Marcella, I'm curious if, if you want to emphasize one or two things that um, really um, captured you while you were taking care of this patient or learned about this case before you even presented. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much. Um, I think that leprosy in general just makes me feel so like humble and it's, it's like syphilis or TB that 
um, before I thought it would be something more like, oh, neural symptoms and skin lesions, but no, we can have like a very broad differential diagnosis, especially because it can depend on the your immune um, like response to to the mycobacteria. So you can have like tuberculoid to the promotos. It can change a lot. And we also can have leprosy reactions that it's just like another completely different thing and it's acute and it can be very severe. Uh, and I think in this case, uh, I want to emphasize how important it is to like consider the epidemiology. I know that I didn't say about the, the brother and the mother, but it's like a key factor. <laughs> but we are in Brazil and that, that was something so determinant in the case. Uh, consider like a patient from India or Brazil because we are like the big countries of leprosy. Uh, it's like key factors. And another thing that uh, it was very remarkable to me is that you need to have a close vigilance system for leprosy. So if you have a, a household contacts, you need to take care of them. Like for Brazilian guidelines, you need to watch them every year for uh, at least five years. But that patient, he just got lost. And then he was having symptoms for one year uh, and he was very, very ill, so severe. Uh, and it can leave a lot of marks, even like amputation or like, way laws and things like that so that was like my main teaching point i think yeah i think that's an absolutely superb teaching point marcella truly thank you so much for making it and and yeah i think the theme of, of this week was obstruction 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 and wait don't forget about granulomatous diseases and a really humble reminder of those um i'm going to turn off the um uh, turn off the recording and thanks to thanks to the folks who are tuning in on youtube um and for those of you who are um still 